so hi everybody. Uh, this in this presentation you get two for the price of one. Uh, Guillaume, uh, he's the two. I'm the zero. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, time series scheduling uh, because that's primarily what we actually do here uh, in the team. A lot of time series data comes in Critio and we process it. And so we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to eventually get to where we are today and where we'd like to be, but we're actually going to go through uh, sort of the history uh, of, the, of the conception of the different tools and whatnot that, that got us to where we are today. So I'm uh, Justin Coffey. I lead the sort of what we call the scalability analytics group at Critio. We're basically in charge of everything that's batch processing uh, at Critio. Uh, and uh, Guillaume is a tech lead. I'll let him. Yeah, uh, so I'm a dev lead here in the analytics infrastructure team. And I'm working on the tools and especially on the time series scheduler we'll uh, presenting uh, you today. Uh, and so actually, there's, uh, there's a few other people here. This guy. Okay. Uh, who um, is also a core contributor to some of the stuff at the end. So feel free to ask questions uh, at the end of him or him or me. Uh, either one of them, though, will be more interesting uh, as far as responses are concerned. So OK, well, I think we're, we're, uh, then we can just get going. Uh, so let's go. Damn it. Wait. Should we walk now? Uh, OK. So, uh, we want to start off with a little bit of context uh, in terms of what data production looks like, as much as we can you know, visualize what data production looks like. We actually didn't do the DAG thing. We should have done that, but whatever. All right, so uh, numbers. We're going to start off with numbers. So every day, we process uh, four petabytes of data. That is not new data, right? Uh, we only ingest something like 100 terabytes per day. But that 100 terabytes and the sort of the, the, the DAG the global DAG at Critio ends up ingesting four petabytes every day on our cluster. That amounts to 15 trillion records in, two trillion records out. That's measured at the map reduce in, or for the map stage in and the reduce stage out. Uh, and on the order of 300,000 distinct uh, map reduce stages um, executed every day. Over 30 teams running jobs, uh, five frameworks, uh, hive, pure map reduce. Like, there are still people uh, in the world that actually implement map and then reduce. Uh, uh, cascading, scalding, and Spark. Of course, cascading, scalding, hive, map reduce, that's all map reduce, and Spark is like the new thing. Uh, and on our cluster size, uh, we, we talked, you talked about it. Uh, uh, it's now the biggest cluster in, in, in Europe or whatever. In any case, it's getting bigger. Uh, that's where it is today. In like a, a few weeks' time, actually, they're bringing it online. They'll, that'll increase by about 50% uh, in terms of all those cores and terabytes of memory. And we just don't even care about how many petabytes of data you store anymore because that's just a lot. Uh, what does the workload look like on our cluster? It's 50% ETL, uh, like 50% machine learning, and 10% analytics uh, star. Uh, so that is inf indeed 110%, and that is exactly a, a problem. <laughs> it's precisely one of the things we're trying to deal with. Uh, uh, it, it, basically, what we're getting at is that, um, and this I think is something that the Spotify guys uh, uh, are probably maybe chuckled about at some point uh, when I said that. Uh, I, guess, I guess the theory of going to the cloud is that you can kind of resolve that problem. Uh, what this problem is is really the stepwise scaling of on-premises infrastructure and the, and, the, and the linear scaling of demand, right? Uh, and so you get into situations where your demand is over your step, right, in your graph, if you see my hand wavy thing there. Uh, and uh, that's, 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 what, that's what I'm trying to express in those three numbers. Uh, ETL is almost entirely time series. So uh, here, this is one of our little things we do. We, do. we sort of uh, uh, say, okay, for October 2nd, your pipeline is green. That means it's complete and everything's happened. On the December 28th, it's red. That means it's like something's broken. Uh, it's purple, we're backfilling, so on and so forth, right? Uh, here, it's incomplete. Uh, so, so that gives you a, a quick way to take a look as a, as a pipeline owner, like what's going on. Yeah, and ju just to add something uh, about the time series scheduling. So it's very different from the 
you are, you are probably used to cron scheduling, which means uh, like every day at nine at nine a.m. you run this task or, or run this job. It's very different in time slice scheduling because we run a job for each hour, but the time at which we run the job is not necessarily the time for which the job is running. So, for example, we can run today a job that computes data for yesterday. And if the cluster was done for one day, for example, we have to run uh, all the yesterday jobs anyway. It's different from the cron because of the cron, you, you, you run uh, the job uh, when the cluster is up and you run every day, every hour. But if you miss something, it does not matter. You will just run uh, the same uh, job uh, next hour or next day and you don't have to catch, uh, to catch up the... Which it's gets us to machine learning is wow one, right? So uh, at least at Critio, you can think of machine learning uh, stuff as well as sort of data driven, right? Because like, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, well, certainly data driven, but but also time series to some extent. Because what we do, the way that the pipeline works at Critio is that there's a team, uh, one of our teams, uh, that is producing all of the data that is going to be consumed by uh, the machine learning folks, right? Uh, so the ETL stuff, uh, uh, happens, right? New data segment, new partitions of data arrive for a, a, a new interval of time. We compute all the derivative data sets. We compute the features and spit that stuff out for them. And then, and then they, uh, uh, and then, and then they run. Now, but the thing is, is that, is that the machine learning uh, model is running for, say, a period of 30 days or over a period of say 30 days or even a quarter or in some cases up to six months of data. So every iteration of the, uh, of the prediction is taking, is taking six months worth of data. So yeah, I mean, we can say that, hey, you should run now because there's six more hours of data uh, uh, available to you. But the six on top of the six months is you know not something that actually we've ever really tried to sort of optimize for. So in, in, in effect, what happens is, the machine learning pipeline just ignores the time series aspect of things uh, and just says, okay, I'm gonna execute and then I'm gonna sleep for an hour and then I'm gonna execute and I'm gonna sleep for an hour. And basically what we as the ETL people uh, 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 have negotiated with them is the length of that sleep. <laughs> because when the machine learning models fire up, they just take all the capacity on the cluster, right? Uh, because they're processing six months of data and my pipeline is, co is, is processing three hours. So that's sort of the, the, the difference in the, in the workloads and their behaviors. Uh, so again, the, the, it's DAGs, it's data-driven, it's time series, it's, it's, all, this, it's all this good stuff. Um, but in fact, uh, it's not always data-driven. Uh, this, is, this is a lesson uh, that we learned that we'll talk a little bit more about. But imagine uh, you have uh, 10,000 clients uh, and you want to ingest their 10,000 catalogs and normalize that out into some sort of flattened sort of format, some sort of schema that we can then use to, say, uh, 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 extract features from for, for prediction, uh, for recommendation, uh, or then certainly display products in the, in the, in the ads uh, that we're going to show to our users. Well, we don't know when the products in those catalogs actually update, right? That's the only time we want to change these things is, uh, is when there's something new to add to it. So basically at the, the, the root node in, in these graphs and these, in these workflows is just sitting out there pulling these various uh, uh, sort of external services telling them, hey, you know, advertiser A's catalog is ready to be updated. So you have one node that kind of will spawn a version of, 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 of that DAG, right? You're so to some extent, you're parameterizing the DAG, which we'll get back to a little bit later. Um, but the point is, is that it's not always time series and it's not always data driven. Sometimes it's just you just want to orchestrate. Uh, and then in addition, sometimes DAGs get weird. Uh, and we have this case uh, where we have about a 20 terabyte data warehouse that we, that we load for uh, really fast internal uh, operational reporting. Um, and that thing is like fine-tuned so that we can, we can get, you know, sub-second uh, query times out of that database. Uh, as people click around, you know, they don't get bored, they don't get annoyed, it just moves quickly. Uh, and to do that, we had to do lots of denormalization of the database, that's a whole other topic, but the point is, is that uh, to get uh, um, a stable data model so that we could have stable queries, we'd load data into that, into that schema 
uh, into a single table multiple times. And that's, be, and that's also part of the SLA on that, on that data set. Some of the data comes in very quickly, like the data that we generate that's very lightweight, like the number of displays, the clicks, those sorts of things. But then things like sales, where we try to attribute the sale to a click, that takes extra processing, right? And then we have even bigger sets of data that, that just by their nature, by their size, take a really long time. And so we, we sort of do kind of this poor man's lambda uh, where we just, as we have some more information, we, we enrich that schema. And so that means, but, but we wanna make sure that we're, that's, that's going in the right order. And so we create these artificial dependencies. Uh, so export uh, C depends on export B, depends on export A. And, and that ensures that, that that's executed in the right order. So this is kind of like a weird thing that you want to declare in a DAG. Um, so another thing about uh, uh, the state of Critio data production today is, that is, is backfilling. Like we do lots and lots and lots of backfilling uh, because we produce lots and lots and lots of data. There's distributed ownership of these components that are generating data. And sometimes bugs slip into production. Uh, uh, sometimes production is down for a while, which causes other issues. Uh, sometimes RPM say, hey, you need to add this new data feature into your, into your data pipeline. And then they say, uh, and by the way, the, the, the source data has been there for a year, so now we want you to backfill for a year uh, that pipeline. Um, and, and, and this actually turns out to be a pretty hard uh, topic to master. So what are some of the reasons for that? Well, uh, <laughs> we don't buy a cluster. Clusters are expensive and difficult to scale. Uh, Spotify will attest to that. And your cluster is basically sized to safely process like a day's increment worth of work, right? Now, if all of a sudden you found out that two weeks uh, worth of data is, is corrupt and you need to regenerate it, re-import it, redo whatever, well, you actually can't really do that, right? You, so, so you have to prioritize, you have to think about it, and you know, it's just a pain in the ass. Uh, your, DAG is all, uh, your DAG itself is also optimized to process data incrementally. Uh, so the aforementioned DAG with these, these artificial dependencies just for the, the correct orchestration of it, well, if I'm backfilling, I have all the data by definition, right? I don't need to do export A and export B. I can just do export C. So I want to skip those steps, right? Uh, also, when we're exporting data into, into this database, in, in, Vertica in, in this case, we're exporting data uh, uh, every hour, right? Because we just, there's an hour's worth of data that comes in and we push an hour into, into Vertica as quickly as we can. But that's actually pretty inefficient if you have, you know, two weeks worth of hours to push into that database. So you want to be able to, to then say, hey, well, like maybe I can just push a week in at a time. Because every time we push data into that database, that's lowering the quality of service uh, for our users as well, right? That's consuming processing cycles on that database. Um, and then you're generating all this, all this work on a Hadoop cluster somewhere to do the backfilling. But you also have an SLA to keep to, to, to keep up with, right? And now you might say, so, so you have to keep producing the current data. Now you might say that, well, in, uh, in the event of a production incident, it's not really a problem because your, your SLA is already broken. Your data is corrupted and it's been decided that's bad. We need to fix it. So your SLA is already broken. So who cares? That's arguable. That's just, that we, you know, we can, we, can, we can discuss the merits of that. But what's not actually arguable is that, is that when your PM asks for a new feature, Every time they ask for a new feature, you can't break your SLA, right? Um, so, uh, um, so that's another thing we have to deal with. The other thing is, is that actually, if you if you th if you remove backfilling from the equation, <laughs> data processing is like this really trivial, uh, immutable, append-only uh, uh, problem to resolve. But then the minute you have to go back in time and change something, well, now you're mutating the state of your system, and that brings with it all sorts of other sort of you know problems. For example, who can access that data now, right? And who should be able to access that data while the backfilling is going on or not, et cetera, et cetera. So you get into uh, yeah, all those sorts of problems. And when you, when, when you backfill one source of data, you have to backfill all the dependency as well, so it becomes very complex. So um, consistency, this is another thing, right? Uh, so what's the state of our billable data, right? And by state, what do I mean? Well, by state, I mean, you know, what what is there, right? What, what's the interval of time for which the billable data is complete and correct? 
right? And then across what systems? And then also there's all kinds of derivative you know, uh, 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 workflows. You saw that in the DAG that Spotify presented. You know, one node could have uh, one, one sort of output can have lots and lots and lots of uh, derivative calculations on it. And so how do you guarantee that those derivative calculations are consistent with the source? Uh, data being late, right? So uh, data can be late for tons of reasons, right? Uh, really long dependency chains. So for example, just like, you know, there's like 20 steps of computation that needs to happen before that data is, is available. Uh, slow nodes in your DAG. So somebody has a, has a really, really big uh, a job in the middle, right? So a bottleneck. Uh, and then also just general lack of resources in whatever your, your, your resource negotiator is, you know, yarn or, or, you know, if you're scheduling stuff in mesos or whatever. So that's the that's sort of the an idea of the what's going on at Critio, the scale of it, and sort of the the constraints under which we work. Uh, and so now we're going to start talking a little bit about the things, the software that we've developed along the way to uh, deal with with that sort of set of problems. And of course, um, we didn't know all of those problems when we first started, right? So the, the software that we're building, you know, is incrementally being adapted as we learn about those problems uh, and their particularities. So in the beginning, uh, we scripted our way into a hole. Uh, so uh, Lobster. Uh, Lobster is a while, true, sleep scheduler. So it works perfectly for the prediction uh, problem, uh, but for DAGs, it's a little bit harder. But it's open source. And it is, but it is open source. It's like five lines of Ruby. Uh, you know, knock yourselves out. Uh, so basically, Lobster executes something and sleeps, executes that same thing again and sleeps, executes that same thing again and sleeps, and executes that same thing, et cetera. It's all it's doing. It does a little bit more. Uh, it's deployed inside the projects. Uh, gives some, it gives the project owners some ownership rights. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than that. But uh, the functionality is that. So obviously, that's not going to work for you know, orchestrating a gigantic DAG. Alone. So a DAG is born. Uh, some engineer uh, thought that a DAG might help uh, resolve some of the uh, growing data generation problems that we had. This is like about f five years ago, basically. Uh, this person tended to like Perl and wrote it in said language uh, and created the first data driven uh, workflows at Critio. Uh, problem was that everybody hates Perl. Uh, not me, uh, but everybody, Critio hates Perl. Uh, and so uh, Lobster was written in Ruby. We said, all right, fine, Ruby, whatever. Sounds great. So let's go with that. And so this is what a job definition looks like in Ruby. Uh, well, in our little jobber schedule. Yeah, it's not exactly Ruby, actually. It's a Ruby template file that generate XML file. So it's a mix of XML and Ruby. Right, so uh, that brings us to Jobber 101. So at the time, Uzi did already exist. Uh, it, was to, it seemed to be basically the only open source uh, solution uh, for uh, job scheduling orchestration. And, but we didn't really like uh, the declarative. We already had this Perl thing, right? Uh, before we knew about Uzi, we already had this Perl thing. And we didn't really like the declarative XML approach uh, that you know, Uzi had. Uh, you know, it's very, it's whatever, what are you going to do? You're going to do stuff by reflection and whatever. So it's really kind of nasty. We didn't like it. Um, and then also, Uzi would have required us to deploy infrastructure. Uh, and at that time, there was no question SRE would not deploy uh, new infrastructure to deal with this problem. They said, you have Lobster. You have a deployment target. Figure it out. So, that's what we did with Jobber. We used ERB templates, as Guillaume said, to generate XML job descriptors that got uh, parsed by uh, Jobber uh, to, to do all the various executions that, that that indicated. And it got evaluated in a lobster loop. So, and, and we'll, we'll show that here. Oh, and uh, for the old people in the room, we used uh, GDBM files to uh, serialize the state. And so the life cycle is lobster executes Jobber. Jobber instantiates its DAG, deserializes its state, associates it with the DAG to see what can be executed, iterates through the possible executions given this state. Once all those executions are done, it shuts down. It waits for Lobster to re-execute it. Yeah, it looks basic, but actually, as you will see at the end, we are 
no back to this model, kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually it's pretty easy to reason about, uh, and uh, it works pretty well. So what are the shortfalls of this model, uh, or of this implementation, I should say? Uh, only one period of a job can be executed at a given time. So uh, this was sort of before we started thinking about time series and, and intervals as sort of first class uh, notions in what we were doing. Uh, so the state's there, the job has a, has a, a period defined, and it looks in the state database, it says, okay, well the next, what's, you know, get next period is a function, and that just gets the next period, and it executes that. Um, this meant that it, for a given job, we couldn't parallelize the execution of that job on different intervals of time. So that means that catching up was very slow, right? One, then the next, then the next, then the next. Um, also monitoring, is, it, well, and also that means that we couldn't really backfill. Like if we backfilled, backfilling meant stopping executing current batches of data, right? Uh, and monitoring is log file based. It had no UI, no anything. Uh, monitoring was very, very bad. Uh, grep, you know, when you're just a whatever devops -y type of person, uh, kind of like us, you know, grep is fine. Like, futzing around with the, the CLI is great. It's amusing. But uh, it's not very good for getting information about the state of what's going on out to a wider audience, right? Yeah, not even SQL in the database because it was a... A key value database. Right. right. So, so yeah, you see, we had all these scripts to like go through the grab a file lock on the on the GDBM data, you know, uh, f uh, file and uh, block execution while you're doing select whatever. Right. It was fun. Um, and but nevertheless, actually, the DAG exploded. This is not a real DAG, unless you no, you know, that's not a real. No, just stole that one. <laughs> but it's the size. But that's of probably it's, yeah. That's it's like probably. one thousand of jobs, so it's probably yeah, close yeah. to it. This might just be one of the connected components. In any case, uh, so the, I would laughed when Josh uh, had the thing we're doomed to succeed. Uh, indeed, uh, without any uh, coordination, we too were victims of our own success. Uh, as soon as the word got out that they're, oh wow, you can do data-driven scheduling, all I have to do is just merge an, an ERB file into your project, it's awesome. <laughs> and so all these jobs started coming, I got this gigantic thing. And then we, we just couldn't reason about anything anymore. You know, the combination of the shortfalls of monitoring, of the execution model, made it just impossible for us to uh, guarantee SLAs do anything, right? It, yes, it will get executed of that we're certain when we have no clue. So uh, that was that was uh, uh, the 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 long ago past, but actually Jobber is still in existence because there, there's apparently a pirated. Somebody told me yesterday there, there's some analysts who uh, heard that Jobber is being uh, decommissioned and uh, they, they're trying to fork the repo and open source it or something. So whatever. Uh, but so it still exists. We're trying to kill it. So uh, current production divided and conquered. So uh, um, now the major problem was we, we had this like functionally correct thing, but operationally it had issues, right? Um, and we figured that we had, we had, you know, gotten to the point where we understood those issues sufficiently that we could do a complete rewrite uh, and, and produce something much better. Uh, and so we go from a lobster to a langoustine. Uh, and uh, just so that people know uh, who are not French in this room, it's a known fact, but French lobsters are blue. Oh. Blue. Uh, and so um, our theory about scaling the DAG was that we don't want to scale the DAG. Everybody gets their own piece of the DAG, and you deal with it, right? Like, you're the owner of your DAG, you're the owner of your SLA, you're the owner of, of the quality of what's going in, what's coming out, right? Or primarily what's coming out. Uh, so from that, we said, well, Longoustine isn't going to be a service, it's not going to be any of this, it's just going to be an embedded scheduler, it's going to be a jar, a self-executable jar, and then you're off and running. Wow, all right. Um, one of the best parts of Jobber was using code in, you know, ERB templates uh, to describe jobs. We really, really like that, um, and Luigi proves that that's a good idea as well. Uh, and then we thought, well, Scala is, you know, a great language for uh, um, writing DSLs, so maybe we can do something really cool with Scala and this notion of uh, DAG and job definition. And having, having a compile language, it's even better because you can detect some error at compilation time, so. 
Right, with uh, Jobber, you know, we had these test scripts or whatever to make sure that your graph was like fully connected, there are no orphan nodes and that, you know, whatever. And obviously with uh, uh, Scala DSL, that goes away. So this is what uh, the DSL looks like. Guillaume, I don't know. Yeah, so this is the part not, uh, each uh, value here, like the dim device, is a job itself and the job declaration is, uh, is not shown it. here. That's a job. Yes, that's a job. And the job declaration is not shown here, but basically a job in Langoustine is a pr primary task and a set of cleanup tasks. So the cleanup tasks are run before, and then when all the cleanup is done, the primary task is, uh, is executed. And that's true. That's a, we totally forgot to put that in the presentation. Like, we assume that you know, everybody knew that your jobs had to be item potent because they were going to, you know, all these schedulers, right, are at least once uh, executions. We have no guarantee that at any time we're not going to re-execute a, a mm. node in your graph. Yeah, because you can, you can, the scheduler can submit a job on the cluster, on the Hadoop cluster, and at some point, it shut down because uh, there is many reasons to, to shut down. And so it doesn't know the output of the job, so it has to run it again, and uh, so it's at least one uh, scheduler. So each value is a job, and we basically use the Scala DSL to connect the job uh, to create some graph, and we create, uh, so daily dims, here, the first one is a graph, and we can connect a graph with other graphs. So, for example, the final dim dimension export is uh, all the daily, di daily dimension and the hourly dimension. And so we have these two, these two ways of uh, connecting graph uh, or jobs, depends on, to, to say that uh, a job has a dependency with another job, and, uh, and end, and end is basically, uh, there is no dependency, but you, we just uh, want to run uh, these two things independently. Right, so and is sort of aggregating, depends on, is creating a relationship, mm -hmm. and then between the two you can say that, you know, a job depends on multiple things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what's nice actually about this is that you can sort of, uh, you can see it here, we said, oh, well, you know, there's this logical little graph uh, of dimensions or this group of jobs. It's not necessarily even a graph because it could just be and, 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 right? Uh, or a dependency. It couldn't necessarily have a dependency. But uh, so we're, we're going to sort of group logically uh, uh, daily dimensions and then we have hourly dimensions, things that we want to uh, uh, compute hourly. And then we're going to be able to combine all those things uh, uh, more easily. So we can like step by step aggregate uh, uh, jobs into, you know, uh, values in Scala. Mm -hmm. so. And because it's a real programming language, it's so this example. Are you trying to say that Perl's not a real programming language? Yeah, is that, no, is that no any programming language will, will do the trick actually. But this example is pretty static, so you could declare that in XML or on a static declarative language. But actually, because it's Scala, you can create more sophisticated uh, <coughs> stuff. So, for example, you can have function function, and when you call the function, it creates a graph, and then you can connect them dynamically the different graph uh, at runtime. And uh, so it's 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 way more interesting to have a, a real uh, programming language here. Yeah, that's actually we do that uh, quite a bit. Um, we have a notion of compute platforms. Uh, so when we when we deploy, well, not we, but Critio uh, deploys their front end applications, what we call TLAs, right? The things that are like displaying banners and whatnot. Uh, we deploy those across the world, right? We have seven data centers across the world, and actually every two two data, uh, I guess we have eight, uh, whatever, so nine, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, a pair of data centers creates a platform, and uh, that's how the data c is gets ingested into Hadoop, is broken down into platforms, right? And so uh, sometimes you wanna do computations that are platform specific, so basically, but, but really it's pretty rare that for one platform, you do something that's different than another. So what you're probably going to do is you're going to say, I'm going to create a graph that's for one plat for, for all the different platforms. And at some point, I'm going to aggregate that, right? Because I want to I want to have the, the the cumulative output of all that stuff. But the uh, uh, the point is is that we can define the graph, and then we just iterate over. We we just iter iteratively make copies of that uh, parameterized with the the, the, pl the correct platform. And so you know, it's a lot better than duplicating all that code, right? Because the graph can be complex. So, um, we realized one of the biggest pain points in Java was the backfilling, was the catch up. Not even backfilling, but catch up was just one of the biggest problems. So, uh, data ingestion into Hadoop is down for a while, or Hadoop is offline for a while, and there's a bunch of data ingestion that's going to all just pop in, right? Uh, we might have two or three days worth of work to catch up on for some portion of our, of our DAG. 
Um, Java is just like, have a real hard time with that, right? Uh, or if we were releasing a new job and the, and the owner said, yeah, I want, the, I want that job to uh, uh, be computed starting a month ago, well, it was gonna take like a month for that to catch up kind of thing, right? So um, the idea with Longest Team was that we would be able to parallelize uh, uh, in a controlled way um, executions of a given job. So for if you have, you know, N intervals, we could have N uh, 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 um, executions in parallel, you know, constrained to the, the, the uh, based on what the graph says. And we make a real usage of the cluster now. I mean, when we migrate a project from Jobber to Langoustine, suddenly you use uh, way more uh, uh, resources on the cluster. Which is not our fault. The, uh, the other thing that we, that we included uh, is the idea of uh, flexible intervals. So um, a job can, uh, is normally has a base period of hourly, right? But then we can actually parameterize if there's a day's worth of work to do, uh, if that job says that yes, I can have flexible periods and up to this period, this amount of time, we might cut that job up into three uh, jobs of parameterized with uh, eight, eight hours each, right? And, and that's, this is because we, we are able to do these two things, and these are like the two killer features in Langoustine above the, the stuff that was in Jobber, um, uh, because we started treating the notion of time uh, as a first class uh, uh, principle in uh, 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 the scheduler. And then we also gave it a UI. So uh, this is, I guess, the third iteration of the UI. Uh, and you know, whatever, it's kind of the basic, sta basic stuff. Um, did you put the calendar in? No, you didn't. Nope. Uh, we also have a, a calendar view, uh, which is sort of the thing I showed at the, we showed at the beginning, which gives you, you know, you just want to see Can this big block all being green. Let me show it. Uh This one, so this is one of uh, our production pro uh, project. So the calendar allows us to, to know uh, which part of the, of, the, uh, of the calendar is done completely and uh, not done yet. So there is some artifact here uh, because of the design of Langoustine. For example, the past here is blue, so you have uh, the impression that the past is not done. And it's just because uh, we constantly add new, new, new job to our uh, DAG. And when we do that, oh. when, we, when we do that, basically, it, it means for the system that the past is missing some, some job execution. So it becomes uh, blue instead of uh, green. And yeah. So this, this, we'll talk about that as part of the lessons learned uh, in doing this. Uh. And you, 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 can, you can see the, the, the job here. And we have a graph, uh, graph view. But it's not really easy to understand the graph. As you see, uh, our graph uh, are uh, pretty complex, and it's not really at uh, really easy at all to to understand uh, what what are the dependencies. And and just to give you guys an idea of the of of what a graph is at at Critio, this is a single um, workflow. This is a single data product. Actually, this is this is the just one. Uh, this is backing one application, um, and uh, it's dependent on other uh, graphs like this. Uh, they there's a little RPC pro thing that, so I can't really call it a protocol, but whatever. Longoustines can communicate to resolve dependencies with, uh, between them. Uh, and so, you know, that's a lot of nodes to just produce one data product, and then you can imagine, you know, uh, all the different uh, dependencies that, that, that could be there. Okay, back to the presentation. Uh, so Longoustine also, uh, it's got log files, you know, you can still use grep, but uh, state, uh, the state of the graph uh, was also exposed uh, in an HTTP API, uh, more or less RESTful, and allowed us to build tools like this. This is our, what we call slab, an SLA board, which allows us to fix an SLA uh, and, and sort of, through another Scala DSL, describe nodes that are, that are we consider to be critical things uh, in it. An interesting thing here is what we, Sometimes, sometimes you're responsible for something, right? Uh, but it's delayed because of something you're not responsible for. Uh, and this is a way to do like guerrilla, uh, um, like guerrilla escalation or something, right? Like basically, we would give we give these boards to our escalation team. They have the the URLs to them, and if our SLA is red, they come they come to it. 
with, you know, through alerting or whatever, they come and, oh, it's red, oh no. And they see that you know, some sort of dependency downstream is, is red over here. Well, they no longer call us. <laughs> they, call, they call this team. So uh, that was sort of a little hack. Uh, so, okay, so long as it's great, like, let's, let's all drink a beer, right? Uh, no, it has bad parts. So, uh, everything is a time series, except that we already established that it wasn't. Don't ask us why we forgot that uh, when we wrote this, but everything is not making, we basically ignore that, saying, oh, well, everything should be a time series, or kind of is if you squint, and so we'll just ignore that edge case and go into huge production with Longoustine, and then, you know, insert hacks here to uh, work around that problem. And, and, and primarily, what's, what, what is, you know, a, a, a core problem is actually that uh, Longoustine is a parallelizing time series scheduler. So we need to make sure that, but some things can't be parallelized, right? Some things can only be executed once. There is no time series. There's, there's no real interval of time. So uh, uh, there's a version, right? There's an increment. It's like a monotonic thing. It's going to be executed now, and then it's going to be executed again, and then it's going to be executed again. But they can never be executed in parallel. And so we had to do lots of stupid hacks uh, in Longoustine to ensure that that um, you can you can use the maximum uh, uh, the variable period for that like to it's clearly a hack. Yeah. Max periods, you know, maximum interval or whatever uh, or in, uh, integer. So um, it was a genius idea to use Scala. It got Guillaume Bort to come to Critio, um, or at least it convinced him to to agree to work with us. Uh, it also um, you know we did we did create a really nice, uh, concise DSL. That's really cool. But this was our first real Scala project. Uh, and we got pretty excited about a lot of things that Scala could do. Uh, and um, that introduced a lot of complexity that we thought was useful. Uh, but in the end, was actually just complexity for complexity. Um, the core thing that we talk about here uh, is that uh, we use macros to generate um, the graph. Because we, what we've, I don't want to go too far into this. Uh, if you're, if anybody's interested in this, uh, uh, you can talk to me. We're actually going to open source this code as like an, as you know, example code, not to be used in production, but just as a reference. Uh, but the the idea is, is we wanted to separate the definition of a job, like uh, uh, you're declaring what you would like to have done, right? Like uh, transform A to B, uh, from the way that it's going to be executed, right? Uh, so, you know, for the functional geeks, sort of like creating a free monad, right? So, like, you're, you're describing what's going to be done, and then at compile time, deploy time, it's going to actually, you, you know, based on how you've, uh, 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 what you've declared implicitly elsewhere, uh, um, that's how it's going to be executed. And the, the example that we always cited when we conceived of this feature was, Back in the olden days, uh, we execute, well, we still execute tons of Hive, right? And back in the olden days, we uh, uh, forked the Hive uh, shell uh, to execute everything. And that spawned lots and lots of GVMs on our gateway servers, created lots of load, all this other stuff. It was, it was unpleasant. Hive had something called Hive Server 2, and we could attack that guy just by JDBC or by its thrift protocol, which would be much lighter. And we said, well, we don't, we're not sure how that's going to work, right, when we, were, when we were working with Longoustine. So we're going to have, we're gonna, the default execution model for Hive jobs is going to be a shell executor, right? But then someday we're going to have a Hive Server 2 executor, and we'll just replace it, and it'll be seamless, it'll be magical. We've, we've never done that. So, you know, whatever. Uh, and then uh, purely embedded scheduler, you know, it's your problem, deal with it. So no infrastructure, yes, we're happy. Except somebody actually owns that infrastructure that all this stuff is getting deployed on. And so that meant that we were just like kicking the can down the street, right? We were just telling another team to deal with it, uh, which was actually not very nice. Yeah, when we have more than 50 projects, and no real infrastructure rules to, to manage them all. It's very difficult to do some migration to ensure that everyone is at the right version, and everyone has a good database, and so on. So uh, that's sort of that's actually what we're where we are today. Uh, Longoustine is driving something you know on the order of fifty percent of the load on our Hadoop cluster. So the thing works. It's great, but it has some operational headaches. And the f but we think the future looks really bright uh, because we're now applying this latest set of lessons that we've learned uh, to creating kettle. I don't. I think the, the real word is kettlefish, right? Kettle. Yeah, but that's too long. But we call it kettle, 
And so we are still not sure that he's a, a real uh, crustacean. Uh, if there is a specialist somewhere, you can... Uh, yeah, if anybody can solve that debate, you know? <laughs> no? Right. But, yeah, so we are pretty happy with, uh, with Langoustine, but uh, of course uh, th there, was, there was a lot of, uh, of pain point and some stuff we, we wanted to change. So we decided to create another scheduler. The, the other thing that's nice about Cuddle uh, is that it's cuter, I think. I think it's like a, I mean... Yeah. Wait, all right, here. The logo is easier to draw. And when, so at first, uh, we had a look at, the, uh, at Langoustine and we said, oh, okay, Langoustine is, is, is almost uh, perfect and we will not create another schedule, we'll just create Langoustine++. Plus Plus. So the, the original name for the project was Langoustine++. Plus Plus. Uh, and after the kickoff, uh, the, the kickoff document and the design discussion, we decided to go with uh, something a bit different. And uh, that's why we, we chose a, a new name that is Kuttel. But the, the basic goal was to clarify uh, some, uh, some, uh, some point in the model, uh, to simplify the Scala API, to provide a better UI, and to solve this operational uh, uh, pain point. Uh, so if you look at the, so it's clearly it's still a work in progress. We plan to have something uh, ready to use by the end of the month. But clearly, if you look at the, at the current uh, code base and the current example, it's still pretty close to, to, to Langoustine. You still have this uh, concept of, uh, of job. Uh, we be, in Langoustine, we have job and task. It was not really clear uh, the difference between both. That's why in Kettle, we just have job. We don't have task anymore. Uh, we still have um, uh, hourly job, daily job, uh, and we have the same kind of the same DSL to, to express the dependencies. So you can see here, where is uh, you can see here the world dependence LO1, LO2, and LO3, which is very close to Langoustine. So it, it's very close. It's a bit, it's not backward compatible uh, exactly, but it's very close. It's very easy to adapt if you were following the, the time series model of Langoustine. Uh, but the main uh, point we wanted to solve is this time series thing. So as we have seen, not, no, uh, not all uh, projects at Kriteo are time series based, and we wanted uh, a way to handle them. So we had no choice uh, than making the scheduling part pluggable. So saying that, OK, uh, long, uh, Kettle is an executor, is a scheduler but we'll split uh, in two parts, the executor itself and the scheduler, and the scheduler will be kind of pluggable. So we'll uh, ship with a time series scheduler, but you will be uh, allowed to push another uh, scheduler. And for now, we are working on a simpler scheduler, what we are calling a monotonic, sch monotonic scheduler, and which is very simple, we just uh, execute the DAG once, and at the end of the execution, execute it again. So it's very close to the catalog and power use case we, we were talking uh, before. And <coughs> the time series scheduler is still there out of the box. It's, it's, it's where we, we, we put um, uh, most of uh, our work today. But we, had, we have added uh, some new features, a missing feature in Langoustine. Basically, we wanted a better way to handle time zone and to handle time offset. So for example, you, you, you have these daily jobs that depends on other daily jobs, but with a three hour offset. And that, that was kind of possible in Langoustine, but that, 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 that was a hack. And now in Kettle, that, that's clarified. Uh, and the executor itself, in Langoustine, the only way you had to execute some, uh, some, some, uh, some task was to fork a process. Uh, like forking another GVM and running Hive or running Yarn. And so we, we kept this, uh, this model. Uh, Kettle comes with uh, executors that allow you to, to fork a process. But uh, again, this part is kind of pluggable and we will uh, ship uh, an execution framework for uh, Mesos because we are using Mesos a lot at Criteo. So instead of forking locally, you will uh, allocate a container on Mesos so you, it will be more isolated and you will be able to say, OK, I need uh, one gigabyte of RAM and three CPU to run this task. And we will uh, also plan to, to ship with a Yarn uh, execution framework directly. So instead of forking a GVM that send uh, something to, to Yarn to, to run, uh, having the scheduler uh, uh, sending directly the task to Yarn. 
Uh, it still has a new UI, and we make a lot of our uh, development budget in this UI because uh, the UI is uh, is the way uh, all team uh, interact with the uh, with the product, and it's real uh, production uh, production work. So you need a real good UI to to understand what is going on in your in your uh, bag, uh, why your job is stuck, and to look at the log and to understand uh, what what is going on. Uh, and it's open source, so the first project, uh, Lobster, was open source. Uh, Langoustine is not really open source, we plan to open the source anyway, but it won't be really usable because it, had, it has a lot of dependency with the internal uh, crypto stack. It's not easy to, to isolate. Uh, but this time for Kettle, we decided to go open source directly, so we develop on GitHub. And uh, so you can follow the development, and you can already start uh, using it. Even if it's not re ready yet, but for the, by the end of the month, we should have something ready. Uh, the bad part of Kettle, they are not uh, known yet, uh, but I'm sure we'll find some uh, <laughs> some bad design decision or some stuff uh, we should have done differently. So You'll have to come back to NAB 2018 yeah. to find that Prob out. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I can show you a quick demonstration of what we have currently on Kettle. While, while Guillaume's doing that, I think we're a tiny bit short on time. But if anybody has questions, now just go ahead and shoot. And while he's getting there. No? Yes. The logic of the job and the DAG. Well, uh, I think Guillaume will, sh Guillaume will show that. But the the hello world thing, right, was a shell task. So the logic of the job is 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 a, is a shell task, right? Um, in that case, uh, I guess my question was: so, given that the DAG is in uh, Scala, is it possible for the task itself to return some kind of value for the next next task to make some kind of decision based on the return? No, that's that's parameterized parameterized by the scheduler. So jobs can't pass output in output to input for other. Uh, we assume that, that that that's the other thing, right? We 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 forgot to format it. This is, cuddles a side effect generating scheduler, right? So it's all side effects. Like the thing that's happening in the in in cuddle when it's executing the function is that that's a side effect generating function, right? The only thing it returns is its status. Uh, but on the other hand, you build the scheduler to pass to parameterize the jobs for you. Like the, so in the time series scheduler, it's parameterizing with intervals. Uh, you could imagine in a scheduler uh, for running a catalog import, import workflow, right? You might, you might parameterize the graph with a set of advertiser uh, client IDs whose, catal whose catalogs you would like to process, right? Thanks. Yeah, so this is a side effect. When we declare a job in Kettle, we give a, we give it a name or an identifier, doesn't matter. We give it, we uh, configure it depending on the scheduler. So because it's a time series scheduler here, we pass a time series configuration, like hourly with a that start date. And then we give the side effect function. And the side effect function currently, and will be changed a bit, is uh, just a Scala function that takes an execution context with an execution ID and, a, and a, a lot of information, and that returns a future. And the future can be successful or failed. And the scheduler will, uh, will understand the result of the future as the result of the job. And then we provide some execution framework. So I was talking about the local execution framework. And this is this SH string interpolation in Scala that allows you to fork a process, for example. But you can, the side effect can be pure Scala or can use one of our execution framework to fork a local process or to submit a job to Yarn or to allocate a container on Mesos or Spark. Or you can do whatever you want, actually. Also, you don't see. I mean, we're not actually using it in the in these scripts, but because this is a, a time series uh, uh, um, schedule, uh, the E here provides the, um, the 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 interval of time for which you're supposed to execute your your task. Is there any way to handle breakpoints in the DAG? Enfin, uh, uh, checkpoints. I mean. <coughs> Well, so that's sort of the idea: is that every node that you describe in your DAG is explicitly a checkpoint, right? So it can resume from wherever that is, right? So, so you you when we do data pipeline development, we think about those the expense of 
So you know you you could you could express all of that in like a single like a lot of the data pipelines we do we could you could express all of it in like one big gigantic scalding uh, 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 job right but you know if it fails you have to roll back all the way to the beginning and you've wasted a lot of compute so when you're designing the 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 scalding job uh, you break it apart into what you think are the checkpointable spots and the reason and where you might want to do some reutilization of output. Um, and then you say each one of those things are these. So we checkpoint here, 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 right? And then and then you it just picks up, you know, when you restart uh, if if Longestine crashes or if the job crashes or whatever, it just picks up from there. It depends of your scheduler, but the time series scheduler it will try to complete every period of your calendar, always. So it, it, it won't accept a missing period in your calendar. It will uh, try again and again. Uh, but you can have a scheduler that try to execute your graph once. And if there is a failure, it will just uh, fail the execution and say report an error somewhere and, and, and try uh, next, uh, the, the second day or something. And so yeah, we just, just show the, the UI. Uh, so this is uh, the, one of the pro uh, example projects, Hello World. Uh, here is uh, the DAG, and this DAG is run uh, for a calendar, so here it's running uh, since yesterday, and you can look at some jobs which is uh, currently running. And, and there is some stuck jobs, so this one has failed once and is retried by the scheduler, so it's marked as stuck. And you can open it and see the, the last uh, failed execution, for example. Uh, we are still missing the time series UI that allow you to, 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 to see the calendar. But uh, once we have that, uh, it's pretty uh, ready to, to be used in production. And I think we actually have to stop there. Uh, so I know there's an extra question. Just grab us. Uh, you know, we'll down the rooftop, whatever. Yeah. So if anybody has any more questions, just feel, f feel free to, to grab us. And of course, uh, uh, just like with uh, Shio, you can star cuddle and follow the development.